Hello and welcome. On behalf of the staff and board members of Humanities New York, thank you for joining us for our program this evening. My name is Sarah Ogre and I am Executive Director of Humanities New York, the host of tonight's conversation, the second town hall in our series, What Does Democracy Demand? I would like to say that our team at Humanities New York is shocked and saddened by the insurrectionist actions at the Capitol last week. We all conceived of this series as timely, but never imagined that the kind of deeply informed commentary we expect from our speakers today would be running alongside these particular headlines. We are incredibly honored and humbled to have this opportunity tonight. Uh, one quick word about Humanities New York. We are the New York State affiliate of the National Endowment for the Humanities, and also the sole organization tasked with promoting the humanities uh, the public humanities in New York State. We do this through grants, through discussion-based programs, a public humanities fellowship program, a critically acclaimed podcast on women's history called Amended, and events like this one. If you would like to learn more about Humanities New York or would like to support our work, please visit our website, um, humanitiesny.org. Next, I need to say a few things to frame tonight's event. As I mentioned, this is the second town hall in uh, What Does Democracy Demand, a two-part series. Last month, we convened the same group of thinkers to address the topic of first principles, an exploration of some of the essential aspects of democratic society, as well as the contemporary threats to those essentials. You can find a video of that incredible conversation at Humanities New York's YouTube page. Next week, we will host a free community conversation facilitated by one of our staff members where you can expand on issues presented here in person in more detail if you wish. Uh, we, in person, we do that over Zoom. Uh, you'll get an in, uh, informational email about that uh, tomorrow after this event. We do a lot of discussion-based programming and in order to kind of model that, we want to get your questions throughout the presentation and not just at the end. The presentation part of the program will break after about 20 minutes in order to turn to some of the audience questions. And then that will continue through the rest of the event. In order to pose a question, which you can do from the get-go, please use Zoom's Q&A function on the bottom of your screen to submit and then also vote for questions that you like. These town halls and conversations were funded by the Why It Matters Civic and Electoral Participation Initiative administered by the Federation of State Humanities Councils and funded by the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation. Everyone at Humanities New York is really grateful for the opportunity provided by Mellon and the Federation, and we wanna also thank their respective leaders, Elizabeth Alexander and Phoebe Stein. I want to also thank my coworker, Michael Washburn, and the rest of the staff members who made this event happen. Our board, chaired by Sarah Gelman Carney of Buffalo, has been extremely enthusiastic about these programs and I want to thank them for that and their attendance as well. Tonight's event will run about an hour and a half. And so with that, <clears throat> I have the extreme pleasure of introducing our speakers. David Bromwich is Sterling Professor of English at Yale University. His books include Politics by Other Means and Moral Imagination, and The Intellectual Life of Edmund Burke, From the Sublime and Beautiful to American Independence, and How Words Make Things Happen. Jedediah Purdy is William S. Beinecke, Professor of Law at Columbia University. His books include This Land is Our Land, The Struggle for a New Commonwealth, After Nature, A Politics for the Anthropocene, and For Common Things, Irony, Trust, and Commitment in America Today, among other books. Leah Wright Rigger is the Harry S. Truman Associate Professor of American History at Brandeis University. She is the author of the books, The Loneliness of the Black Republican, Pragmatic Politics and the Pursuit of Power, and Mourning in America with a U, Black Men and Women in a White House. Brandon M. Terry will moderate. He is Assistant Professor of African and African American Studies and Social Studies at Harvard University. He is currently completing two books tentatively titled the Tragic Vision of the Civil Rights Movement, and Sovereignty, Soul Craft, and Suffering. Brandon will moderate it, as I mentioned. So thank you again for joining us. And Brandon, let's begin with you. So much, Sarah. Um, I just want to thank you and Michael Washburn and the teams at Humanities New York and the Mellon Foundation, my dear mentor, Elizabeth Alexander. 
uh, for making space again for for this vital and pressing uh, set of questions um, concerning democracy and the fate of democracy here in the United States. Uh, our, our subject tonight, um, another reconstruction, could not come at a more appropriate, if nonetheless unsettling and frightening time. Uh, in a December 1866 essay for The Atlantic, uh, the great abolitionist, civil rights leader, an intellectual and of course uh, transplanted New Yorker, Frederick Douglass pondered the possibilities of reconstruction after the American Civil War. And I actually thought his remarks on the kind of occasion he found himself navigating are useful spur to our conversation this evening. Uh, when reflecting on the Southern revolt that set in motion civil war and the struggle to remake America in its wake, Douglas writes, there is cause to be thankful even for rebellion. It is an impressive teacher, though a stern and terrible one. In both characters, it has come to us and it was perhaps needed in both. It is an instructor never a day before its time for it comes only when all other means of progress and enlightenment have failed. Whether the oppressed and despairing bondman no longer able to repress his deep yearnings for manhood or the tyrant in his pride and impatience takes the initiative and strikes the blow for a firmer hold and longer lease of oppression, the result is the same society is instructed, or maybe. We live, at least in reference to the recent American past, in an increasingly rebellious age of politics, a sustained upheaval that has raised unsettling questions about the fate of our country and the fate of democracy. But just precisely what, to paraphrase Douglas, our age of rebellion has instructed us in is essential to any sense of the direction in which a possible democratic reconstruction for our own time or our near future might endeavor. The title of our forum invokes the radical transformative experiment in multiracial democracy known as Reconstruction, which followed the defeat of the Confederacy and the formal abolition of chattel slavery. But we are not, of course, the only ones turning to this historical example to cast light on our present. The Poor People's Campaign led by William Barber is calling for a third reconstruction. So is the historian Robin Kelly, who identifies such a movement with the movements for police and prison abolition. Uh, we see liberal journalists insisting that the racial and partisan violence and authoritarianism that destroyed reconstruction is a warning for us today. We see Confederate flags being waved in the Capitol building as it was seized by the mob last week. And even Ted Cruz, the Senator from Texas, his address from the Senate floor approvingly invoked the infamous Hayes-Tilden Compromise of 1876 that formally ended Reconstruction. So we're awash in gestures to this American inflection point. And I'd like to begin there um, as the title of our event does uh, with that provocation. And I want to turn to Leah here because when I asked for book recommendations last time, Leah suggested that the book she most wanted people to read over the holidays for a discussion about democracy was W.E.B. Du Bois's Black Reconstruction. So Leah is also on this, um, on, on this, on this moment of, of reflection on reconstruction. And I want to ask her, why did you suggest that book? Why in this moment are people turning so readily to reconstruction as a touchstone for political judgment, historical lessons, and civic warnings, or even civic hopes? So first, let me say thank you all for having me back here again today. And I'm, I'm really excited for this conversation. I think it comes at a, you know, both a turbulent time, but also the right time. Um, to have these kinds of conversations, which are really quite important, uh, particularly in the public domain. Um, and I will say that what I had in mind when I thought about Black Reconstruction uh, was rethinking really what we mean by democracy in this country, but also what are the necessary steps for us to get to democracy. And so when I think about Black Reconstruction and when I think about what Du Bois was writing about in this moment, 
part of what he's trying to do is really make sense of the failure of reconstruction and the failure of democracy for the majority of the nation's black citizens and really have an accounting of this in part because the disciplines of history and sociology just simply don't have room for a black accounting of what happened and how black people had been marginalized. I also think it's important, one of, you know, one of the things that I wanted to point out with black reconstruction that Du Bois does quite just brilliantly is points out that black people had power. They did have right these, the elements of freedom in citizenship and they had it with the force and the enforcement and the protection of the federal government. So that, you know, the idea that, you know, um, we had black senators, we had black representatives, we had a black lieutenant governor, we had black people in positions of power across every single aspect of, you know, American society, but that it was a deliberate and calculated effort connected to the economic well-being of the South and the revival of the South that stripped those benefits away. And that it could, if it so effortlessly could be done in particular ways, that what would that mean for the future? So I think what Black, what Black Reconstruction does is lays out a blueprint. And the reason why people keep coming back to this, whether it be not just you know, uh, 19 uh, or uh, uh, the 21st century, this moment where historians are kind of really engaged with this, but also we see you know, nods to the reconstruction period in 1960 through you know, the SCLC, through the Poor People's mm -hmm. Movement, through Martin Luther King Jr. and things like that. But I think what it is, is this understanding that the roots of undemocratic or illiberal democracy, whatever we're going to call it, or whatever you know, semantics we wanna use for that, that they go deep in this country and that they're rooted in a moment where the nation's most vulnerable are stripped of their rights soon, uh, you know, soon after, you know, we were eight years in power after getting them, that it's a, it's a consequence right, of assuming power and the expansion of democratic rights that then the mom strips them of it. And I think it feels and really resonates in the present day moment. And that's why we keep returning to it again and again. Thanks, Leah. Um, yeah, one of the more striking invocations of the reconstruction example um, was in the Times, the New York Times this week. Uh, Timothy Snyder, the oh. historian had, um, sorry, that's my dog, uh, a major, uh, a major essay called The American Abyss, um, where he argued yeah. that this narrative that we're seeing all around the society, that the election has been stolen, uh, and you know the, the perpetrators of the theft are always shifting, right? It's some amalgamation of radical leftists, Black organizers, globalist Jews, the Chinese Communist Party, uh, Hillary Clinton-sponsored pedophiles, uh, God knows who else. Um, but all of it, he says, amounts to a kind of big lie. And in Snyder's words, it mauls logic. It misdescribes the present and demands belief in conspiracy. And here's the reconstruction point. He says it also reverses this particular big lie, reverses the moral field of American politics and the basic structure of American history. So it pretends that the perfectly legitimate exercise of uh, voting power by black citizens is a coup, while the brazen attempt to suppress their votes or overturn fair results is the salvation of true democracy. Um, and this precedent is really frightening in, in, in the lots of ways that Snyder points out um, and David Blight and other people have shown that you know, in, in Reconstruction, the big lie of white supremacy won for a very, very long time uh, over the spirit of reconstruction. And I'd like, you know, David and Jed, maybe you guys could, could, could start with this. What should be done, you know, if the Snyder diagnosis is right, if one of the major problems confronting democracy at present is the vast ideological reach of a big lie, how do we weaken its hold over broad swaths of the American public. Um, could we could we talk just a, a little more about Reconstruction, maybe on on our way there? And and I hope that what I'll have to say will um, bridge Brandon into uh, a quick response to the question that you just posed. Um, so you you 
um, in your remarks about the currency of the, um, being mentioned, Reverend William Barber, um, and living in North Carolina in the last decades, have marched with him and actually been arrested with him for occupying a Capitol building, though under somewhat different um, conditions than this last week. Um, and so I've spent a lot of time in, in the company of a sort of living, in participating in a sort of living political effort to revive a certain potential in reconstruction. And, and that, as I experienced it in the sort of life of this cross-racial progressive political effort, was that it stood for um, the first moment, really, that the American constitutional scheme becomes plausible as the rudiments of a system of morally defensible liberal democracy. The first establishment of a constitutional conception of universal citizenship to which substantive guarantees of equality and liberty are attached. And it also stood in key respects for the recognition that universal citizenship is inseparable from the organization of political economy. Du Bois's famous phrase about the war and aftermath being the conflict between two systems of political economy, free labor and slavery, um, captures something of course seen in the Freedmen's Bureau, seen in the sort of recognition that remaking an economic order and remaking a political order were two sides of the same task. Um, and it was in those respects, the um, crucible and principle of the possibility of a cross-racial and in, frequently in key respects, class-based majoritarian politics um, across the upper, upper South in particular, just before it was broken. And it was that that was proximately broken in states like, like North Carolina. So a uh, democratic potential that um, emerged alongside the breaking of Reconstruction and its defeat um, has also seemed something um, sort of perennially available for recovery and, and still in need of renewal. Um, it is a sort of incomplete founding to which it's maybe possible to look, in, in, even defeated founding to which it's possible to look back with, in, a, in a different spirit from the first one. And I suppose I mean to say that living in a politics of that kind, and I'll, I'll leave it at that for the moment, as against um, the sorts in which we, many of us now find ourselves maybe the beginning of a sort of the beginning of a gesture toward the question that you really want to put to us, which I take it as a good part of the, the whole question for tonight. Thank you, Jay. David. Um, yeah, we're still finding out uh, about the extent of the disruption, disorder, riot, whatever you want to call it, of January 6th, uh, and the actors behind it and the resentments that fueled it. Um, what I learned today from a story in the Washington Post was a, a much larger role than I recognized that had been played by QAnon. And now that their, uh, all of their tweets and whatnot have been taken offline, uh, unless you go into the archives, I guess it's harder to see what the uh, granular texture was of, of the uh, things that heated them up. But I, I would, uh, I want to go back to Reconstruction briefly, but uh, the first Reconstruction, that is. But I would emphasize that what we've got in this country have had uh, for the last 10 years is a very large, uh, and, and before, but uh, coming more intense these years, 
and leading to the first to the election of Trump, uh, is a very large number of people uh, of more than one race, including white people who are not like the four of us, um, not of our status or education, um, who have felt left behind. And so it is a matter, if we're to speak of reconstruction now, not just of race, though that is prominent and the Confederate flags remind us of that. There have been Confederate flags in every far right demonstration I've witnessed in my 69 years of life. Uh, and it's never been altogether clear what they mean. They're gestures of defiance in general or of Yaboism or of what the hell, but there's certainly racism there that there should be so much of this so risky um, and so violent or bordering on violent um, has I think something to do with the numbers who have felt left behind so that it's a matter not just of race but of money um, and all of this coming in the middle of the COVID months of lockdown dissatisfaction uh, and anxiety. Um, so who has profited at this moment? The puzzle, the um, scandal of the first reconstruction is that the owners of the planter estates, 5% of Southern whites, uh, who perhaps should have paid most heavily in restitution, were uh, instead given back much of what they had instead of the confiscation that was plant, planned for in the land distribution pro programs of Thaddeus Stevens, Charles Sumner, and others of the abolitionists. Who has profited most from this ordeal we're going through with COVID? Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, Google, Twitter. They're enormously enriched. So if I were to offer a parallel for what was not allowed to happen in 1865-66, namely confiscation of the big estates and distribution of them to uh, freed blacks, poor whites, veterans, and immigrants, I would say that as a request, a reforming reconstructionist administration should ask those billionaire companies to contribute through tax enormously to offset the inequalities all over that have fed a lot of the discontents. Um, I wanted to just make one observation about 1863 instead of 1866 and my source briefly is Lincoln instead of Douglas. And I saw that in one of the online sites uh, that quotes this, it is listed as the out of 150 teachable Lincoln documents, it's number 145. I would, rate it, I would rate it considerably higher. And it's a letter Lincoln wrote to the military governor of uh, Louisiana uh, in August, 1863, Nathaniel Banks. And he recommends Louisiana, and here are his words, Lincoln in this letter, adopting emancipation early in those parts of the state to which the proclamation does not yet apply, going ahead of uh, what the laws dictate thus far, where you can. And while she is at it, she is Louisiana, to adopt some practical system by which the two races could gradually live themselves out of their old relation to each other and both come better prepared for the new. That I think is a, um, pretty well-framed goal, even for a second reconstruction, which we can hope lies ahead of us. This prospect of the races living themselves out of their old uh, relation to each other and being prepared for the new. And it's true that that old relation has persisted in many ways, though it is not true to say that anything resembling slavery uh, exists now. And I think getting people to imagine this um, and getting the very rich who have so prospered when so many others have suffered these last few years to p do their part is gonna be another piece of reconstruction. Thank you, David. Um, Leah, do you wanna jump in with, with, with maybe a response to what's been laid on the table? Sure, um, I actually think it would be helpful to perhaps bring some nuance to this idea of the, the notion of being left behind. I actually think it's a really, a really quite important 
um, concept, not just in the last four years, um, but, but much longer, right? This much longer history. And I think it's worth thinking about the way in which this concept of being left behind actually motivates many of the protests that we see over the summer. In fact, this idea of economic inequality is a very old idea. We see it with Occupy Wall Street, but it really comes out to play particularly in the explosion of you know, peaceful protests that come in the wake of George Floyd's death. Right? And, and one of the things that I've pointed out here before, but I would like to emphasize again, is that when George Floyd dies, he's in Minneapolis looking for work because he is underemployed and, and you know, um, unemployed. And so essentially the economic you know, system of the United States has failed him. But I also want to point out that, you know, a certain very sh savvy um, strategist who has been all but blacklisted from the United States in this current moment pointed out on, on a certain talk show, and I won't say the name of it, a couple of years ago on a very notorious network, um, pointed out that the idea of anxiety amongst the nations, particularly the nation's uh, white upper class uh, uh, group was something that could be harnessed and something that could be mobilized in ways that defy the economic and the actual real tangible economic anxiety of the bulk of the rest of the nation. And so I think when we're beginning to see things like the Capitol protests and we're seeing people who are being arrested, who are doctors, who are lawyers, who are former, you know, uh, uh, high paid, high wage, uh, wealthy individuals, right, a former uh, Olympic swimmer, I think we can begin to push back on the nuances of what it means to be left behind. So I don't, I don't challenge this idea that they feel left behind, but I think they're, they're being left behind, that feeling, that sentiment is something very different from the kind of angst that the rest of the nation is feeling. So I, I think it's important that we t tease that out a bit. Just to clarify what I meant, I was not referring to the anxiety of the wealthy, of wealthy whites. I was referring to the anxiety of unemployed whites, people living in dilapidated houses with broken down cars, such as you can see if you drive through rural Maine or rural Pennsylvania. It's all over. So that's the anxiety I was talking about. How far that maps onto QAnon or any such extreme reaction, I have no idea. But there is a lot of that and it is not talked about much among our professional, educated, and media classes. Black suffering among the poor and so on in prisons is talked about, though it has not been remedied. But I'm referring to that group of white people, the poor. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I, I think I took, and Leah, please correct me if I'm wrong. I mean, I, I take the point to be one about a certain kind of sleight of hand rhetorically uh, that that functions um, quite powerfully in Republican politics. And actually, in, in my view, uh, and, and here I tip my, my Black left credentials maybe, maybe a bit too explicitly, but uh, it happens quite a lot in Black politics as well, that um, if you look at kind of late 20th century Black politics, you hear constant discussion of the plight of the ghetto poor and then a set of policy recommendations that functionally accrue their benefits to the black middle class, right? And I think there, there, there is an interesting dynamic here once we start to unpack who showed up at these protests, who's driving, uh, who's driving the kind of um, anger that you're seeing uh, behind these, these uh self-proclaimed patriot movements, people who can take off of work midweek, travel to DC, put themselves up in a hotel. Um, are these the same groups? And I think that is a really important question for what kind of policy responses this moment demands and how we should describe uh, the, the attack that we saw and the energies and rhetoric behind it. Um, but I don't think we're in disagreement about that. I just wanted to, 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 to try to flag that. Um, let me turn really quickly, and, and I just want to remind the audience, we're going to take questions at various points throughout. So you can start submitting questions. I'm just going to ask one more and then uh, start to get some questions from the audience. Um, so I'd still love to hear, hear what you all think about this big lie idea and how, how it might unravel. But Maybe let me go at it a bit more pointedly to, to, 
um, to, to really try to nail you down. So one thing that's always struck me about the enthusiasm for reconstruction talk in this moment and Du Bois's Black Reconstruction in particular is that there's a paradox at the heart of the project. So usually when you hear it invoked, you hear people talk a lot about it's an amazing experiment in multiracial democracy. There's the concept Angela Davis brings up of abolition democracy that's mentioned in the text. And people talk about, as, as you all did, you know, the uh, redistribution of wealth and assets, uh, civic empowerment, public education, cooperative banking, labor republicanism, all of these kinds of radical egalitarian experiments. Uh, but of course, the paradox of Reconstruction is that all of these egalitarian projects are premised on uh, the most deadly conflict in American history, where about one out of nine white men die. Um, and Reconstruction <laughs> itself demands widespread state violence, military repression, paramilitary organization with union leagues and things like that. And when the capacity to deploy that violence faltered, so did all of the projects in multiracial democracy and economic egalitarianism and so forth. And so I just want to ask all of you, is this what we're faced with again? Um, does the fate of egalitarian democracy depend on a more expansive and repressive use of state violence and punishment than liberals have traditionally been willing to explicitly endorse. I'm not saying that they have not deployed it, but they tend not to explicitly endorse it. One of the first things that happened in the wake of the melee at the Capitol is all of these calls for new federal legislation to expand surveillance, expand repression. Oh, yeah. um, what do you think about that in light of this reconstruction analogy? Uh, and maybe let's start with uh, David. Uh, no, it was, it was striking to see uh, left liberals in Congress um, who had been very skeptical of police and protective of protesters over the summer demonstrations after the George Floyd killing, um, saying that the police should have beat up a lot more of these white people. Um, they didn't say it in those words, but that was the exact meaning of what they were saying. And perhaps so, but it does, did seem a switch of affect that was very remarkable and characteristic of our time. Let, let, me, let me put in uh, to evidence three words that are related to each other in obvious ways. Norms, rules, and laws. And norms have been, have been talked about a lot um, lately. What we regard as normal, the thing, the staying within bounds. There's lots of new cliches about guardrails and so on that people use to define norms. Um, and it is, it is said that President Trump uh, busted more norms than any other president, quite true. Um, but behind norms lie habits, just the ordinary ways you have of behaving towards people that you've learned, ways of being polite, ways of being, being tolerable, ways of tolerating others, of listening and of speaking with a certain shading so that you won't be misunderstood. And there's a, what to say, metabolism of communication on which I think democracy depends more than we've ever recognized. Uh, and we're, now that it's slipping away or seems to be broken, we see just how important it is. Um, we're, we're living in a time of an epidemic of communication, very fast communication, very rude communication, very dismissive. Um, the word cancel um, expresses a lot of what is negative about that communication, but the gestures of enthusiasm or you know, pumping, pumping your fist in the air are just as short-winded and just as shallow and often just as insulting. Um, so that's where I think I part company from Tim Snyder about the big lie. There's such a multitude of little lies that leads to general distrust, very big distrust, and makes people want to anchor themselves, especially if they don't know how to get the right sources and if they're ill-educated and if they're single-minded and tending towards zeal or fanaticism and have some festering disappointment or resentment that they're harboring. Um, leads people to go for one story. And among all these distrusts and all these doubts, one story. Um, so I think the, the, um, the uh, uh, what to say, the best way to guard against 
too much need to resort to state violence, state enforcement and coercion in order to obtain a more just society and turn habits into laws, right, at top speed, which we don't want. Um, and, I, you know, many of my uh, liberal friends do want that very fast. They are believers in the administrative state to the last degree. But I think that the cost in freedom is too high there. I think the only offset to it and the only way to guard against it, I'm afraid to say, is education and that the media of communication have to cooperate with education that brings people genuine facts, reliable facts, and creates a common culture of information again. We've never had it perfect, but we've never had it so meager and impoverished as it is now. And that's part of the danger we're living in. Uh, thank you, David. Uh, do any of the others want, you guys want to say anything on this point? Jed? Yeah, uh, <clears throat> I'll quickly. Um, I, was, I was just rereading the social contract recently, and there is a very nice distillation in which Rousseau says in one sentence, that the further the mores, the norms, the attitudes, the habits of the people are apart from the laws, the more violence the state will be required to, to employ. It describes a sort of a three-part relation in which you could say, I think without being, without being at all too clever, um, that what counts as violence or as coercion is uh, constitutively related with what people regard as legitimate, what they're willing to identify with. That is um, the redistribution of this big estates, transfer of wealth has to be done at gunpoint if it takes place in a setting in which it is already experienced as hostile, illegitimate, an extension of a war. Not so in a political culture capable of absorbing it within its sort of resources and vocabulary of legitimacy. Um, so violence is, of course, a fact, but it's not only a fact, um, at least a brute fact, even though it may be the most, the most brute of facts at the same time. Um, when I think about our information, uh, communication metabolisms is a, is a good image, I'm struck by something um, that President Obama said in an interview a couple of months ago, that I thought was emblematically not quite right. Um, he said, if everyone has their own truth, it's a very conventional formulation. If everyone has their own truth, then by definition, he said, by definition, the marketplace of ideas can't work. I, I think it is precisely a certain kind of marketplace of ideas that we find ourselves in. One in which it turns out that the, um, appetite for the consumption of ideas has more to do with how they soothe or agitate your emotional state and affirm your affinities and your enmities than with whatever idea of adequate approximation to truth or functionality is um, implied by that old metaphor. Um, so there's, um, there's a way that we're getting trained into thinking that we don't have to um, contend with unwelcome ideas, ideas that don't make us feel good any more than we have to um, buy and, and otherwise consume something that we don't like. And if the problem, one version of the problem of democracy is living under a common authority and accepting the sharing of authority with people with whom you fundamentally disagree, whom you may fear and dislike, um, then that's a, a very um, dangerous trend. I, uh, I caught these two lines um, from both of you, David and Jed, uh, about education and training. Uh, and it fits with a question that we've got from Mary Jenkins, um, who in the spirit of reconstruction, I mean, you know, what does Du Bois say is the greatest success of reconstruction? It's the, uh, the crusade of the school mom, right? Uh, 
Uh, it's the establishment of, of education in the South. And she says, uh, she asks, do you think that a current reconstruction of democracy demands a reinvestment in civics education? Um, and what I take the provocation to be, just to, to put a slight addendum on her question is, it's like education, training, but of what sort? What sort of education, what sort of training do you all think can meet the demands of the moment? A moment that, as one of our other questioners <laughs> raises, might be described as post-truth um, in a way that's dangerously close to pre-fascist. Uh, or, or authoritarian or, or, or of some sort. So what kind of training, what kind of education can meet the problems that you're describing? Can I, Brandon, can I jump in here just sure. for a second? I have a quick question and then I would love to hear um, David and Jedediah's response to your question. But you know, one of the things that I would love to think about, and this also includes civic education, is thinking about, you know, I'm not in favor of this idea of the administrative state or this kind of heavy handed, you know, law and order response to, you know, what happened on Capitol Hill or subsequent, uh, you know, uh, pre prior events, um, in part because we know who is going to feel the brunt of that punishment. It's going to be the most marginalized, the most vulnerable people in our society, right? And we can have a whole conversation about that. But one of the other things that I want to think about is that we haven't really talked about the regulatory power of the state and the way in which that plays in and how we haven't actually really thought about what an agenda would look like that is not about the punitive long reach of the state, but instead about the progressive possibilities of the state. And so one of the moments that we see that we're, we're, where things really do succeed under reconstruction is where the long arm of the state, and this also is what raises the hackles of so many people, where the long arm of the state steps in and says, we are going to enforce these protections and these radical changes because we know that this is the only way to integrate this population into the broader American fabric. And so I, I wanna think about what that would look like, what that would mean because this is also the thing that we've been told from almost the, the moment that it's introduced that that's fundamentally un-American, that it's wrong to enforce, right? The long arm of the state, that's what we're told is dangerous. So I'd be interested in hearing about that because my thinking on this, particularly as we think about what kind of you know, civic education would be consumable from people, whether it be in Massachusetts or Texas, where the school board is one of the most powerful, you know, bodies in the entire state, how are you going to do that? What would that look like, particularly in a post-truth America? You're certainly right about the, the divide in uh, educational ideologies. I, I read a good book uh, oh, 25 years ago called What Johnny Can't Read, um, and it's about the California and New York uh, school boards as the most repressive, excuse me, progressive in the country, and the uh, Texas and Kansas school boards as the polar opposite. And though, and the, the, it is as if they are different countries. Um, to enforce uh, new, what to say, um, uh, new uh, properties, um, abilities, um, possessions that are taken to be rights that were not rights before, not like the right to vote, for example, or the right to own property, but how much property and so on, to have the state enforce that, um, it, it, it's, it's something that I guess has to be imagined. Um, it, but I'm, it's, it's beyond my imagining right now. And of course, it's not just in America um, that there is this distrust of the long arm of the state. And I would say coercion is bad as such, even if it's not the least privileged who feel the brunt of it. That seems to me a moral fact about oppression. It's always bad, even if it oppresses the privileged. That's just my view. Um, so what you do about previous examples, um, such as the collectivization that went on in the 1930s in Russia, which was about property too, and didn't work even as it was meant to work, how you translate that into something um, that could create greater equality in America and do it without coercion that seems to 
go against our ideas of freedom. I'm, I'm only raising another question, so I'm sorry to feel impotent at the end of this. <clears throat> if, if I might say something to, to, to each theme, um, I think you could make a case that intermittently between 1912 and 1970 and solidly between the mid 30s and the late 60s, the central predominant American public vocabulary about the state and freedom actually envisaged quite a significant protective and shaping role for the state in securing the real conditions of security and freedom in a complex society. And language very much of that kind is present in, not only in the most famous FDR addresses, but in the major addresses of people like Eisenhower, by no means a, a, a lefty, but someone who was very much working within that vision of the responsibility of the state. Um, the protective and regulatory and worker empowering apparatuses that were built up in that period constituted a kind of economic citizenship, really the first time there had been something like economic citizenship for white men, which is to say for the substantial majority, uh, privileged substantial majority of the country. And the relationship between the breaking of that economic citizenship and the second reconstruction that brought black people into an increasingly unequal and precarious economy is obviously a very important one to understand and creates a good deal of the world that we now have to overcome, try to overcome. Um, a thought about education. Um, I, uh, two, two quick things. Um, one is that I, I want to take some sort of lesson and I'm not sure what yet. Um, as a person who teaches and works in the world of law from the way that judges, so-called Trump judges, who are, will be in many jurisprudential respects Trump judges, so consistently um, did their jobs in the face of the orchestrated lunacy of the denial of, of Joe Biden's electoral college victory. Um, there's something about the kind of role morality, the sense of responsibilities that attach in the specific to the position that you occupy, um, that might be a sort of microcosm of what a certain kind of civic sensibility would feel like. You have actual power, you have actual responsibility, and if you breach the responsibility in certain egregious ways, in some sense, you no longer are the person that you said you were, or thought you were when you, when you started out. Um, that's a very powerful sort of constellation of experience, identity, and sensibility that seems to me to come with a certain kind of, of conditional empowerment. Um, which the which judges in the legal profession have. Um, I would contrast that, this is the, the last thing I want to say about this, but I would contrast that with the sort of extraordinary thing um, that Senator Connecticut, Senator Chris Murphy said to the New York Times this last summer, um, quoting, I have a real belief that democracy is unnatural. We don't run anything important in our lives by democratic vote other than our government. Democracy is so unnatural that it's illogical to think it would be permanent. It will fall apart at some point, and maybe that isn't now, but maybe it is. What an extraordinary thing for someone in that position of responsibility to say, and how much that must reveal about the experience of a certain kind of powerful and well-positioned American, including this blank this naked claim that we don't do anything in our lives by democracy which suggests a total lack of experience of anything from a range of religious organizations to labor organizations to civic organizations so i think there's a sort of a sort of hollowing out of the experience of 
power and accountability. To some people, to more people than the country admits, it's always been denied or it's always been ephemeral. But I think there, um, I think it is much more um, characteristic of our experience to find to find talk of self-rule just sort of you know just sort of notional just sort of just sort of vapid. Yeah. Can I just add a, a something I should have said earlier? Um, the idea of a common project such as was put out by FBR through the Works Project Administration and the uh, Civilian Conservation Corps and things like that at the time of, of much greater equality, economic equality in this country in mid 20th century America. Um, that, that gives a kind of model for what, it, you know, what, what could lead to a good use of state power uh, that creates greater equality all around. Um, I think it is common work and the dedication to a common project that helps in that. Something like the GI Bill came out of a common project. Um, and if we imagine that going into job creation for an infrastructure rebuilding, reconstruction, um, and the habits of mutual respect that would come from millions of workers experiencing the working day with each other, you know, there is a democratic groundwork for some real change of habits that can lead to other changes. That's a point I think is really important um, to think expansively about the meaning of education and its various sites. Uh, one thing that's striking to me about the post-truth talk um, is that a lot of the, the arguments, um, the conspiratorial claims are claims about claims, <laughs> right? So they're they're, well, people are making allegations, and therefore, uh, you know, there's something going on there, right? There's if, people wouldn't be making allegations if there wasn't something going on. But the allegations are the evidence themselves. There's no bottom to the allegation, um, so the conspiratorial thinking can just kind of run a field. And then there's a there's this kind of second move where they say, well, well, no one I know. <laughs> uh, you know, voted for Biden. How could this possibly have been the case, right? And when you talk about the kinds of things Leah's laid out, right, the deep segregation at the heart of our society, and that's class segregation, as Davis pointed out, racial segregation, there's religious separation, you know, the famous Martin Luther King line, the most segregated hour um, in American life is Sunday at 11 a.m. That's less true than it was when he was alive, but it's still um, quite true. That there are just there, there are these weird points of um, a failure to make contact, a failure to learn in a kind of shared common enterprise, and that space is increasingly being filled by social media, by the entertainment industry, uh, and the ways in which that's calibrated to play with our affects is really quite toxic. I think in a lot of ways to, to, to democratic society. So I do think that's a really crucial point um, to, to flag in this any conversation about education uh, as we do face a real problem, which is that our school boards, our society are telling very different stories about the country we live in. And so the MSNBC commentators can harangue all day about um, how can this be happening in a White House once occupied by Abraham Lincoln and FDR these people don't know anything about those people. They're not moved by those arguments. <laughs> and they spent a lot of 2017 telling their constituency that the 2016 election was stolen from Hillary Clinton by Russia. So there, those consequences of the, of the rhetoric, I think, have to be worked through um, in this broader pro project of civic education. So uh, I'm wary of time. I am, you know, we, we, we're, we're getting in a great discussion. Um, but I did want to pose to you something that's been uh, asked a lot in the, in the Q&A, um, and I think we should just get it right on the table. Um, I'll frame it a little bit, and then I'll, I'll, I'll put the question to you all. So, you know, one thing I think we've all, as we've talked in last session and this session, one thing that we're all worried about is any narrative that makes 2016 the origin point of a democratic crisis. Like what we're dealing with are much longer term problems, much longer term fault lines. 
Uh, and I think one of the things we do share, despite our disagreements, is um, <laughs> is a suspicion of anybody who's framing the the uh, president's defeat as a kind of return to normalcy, right? That that something more needs to be done. There is a greater or deeper reckoning that that has to take place. Um, so one of the stories that's being told um, about what's happening now is that we're facing a fascist movement, that we are in a fascist, uh, a, a proto-fascist movement, there are fascist elements, that there's a uniquely American form of fascism that's coalescing. What are your opinions about the fascism debate and the utility of that vocabulary for describing the long-term projects and the reactionary movements that um, that are, are are at odds with democratic norms in the present in the United States, I should say. There's elements of of fascism as it's been defined from the Action Francaise in the 20s, the Italian fascist um, polity of the 30s and German fascism that are just missing here and that were that were couldn't possibly be organized by a temperament um, as chaotic as Trump. I mean, fa fascist states ha are for spiritual renewal. So make America great again is, you know, it is, if you will, a fascist like slogan. But there was no ever an, uh, any sign of an organized military arm of the Trump party that was separate from the state. There were not the periodic ri rituals with militaristic direction and purpose. Um, there were no colonialist ventures to other countries. He didn't start any new wars, one of our few recent presidents who didn't. Um, and there's nothing of the corporatism of you know, bringing in such different parts of the economy as industrial workers, the professions, um, you know, uh, property owners, all in different categories to come to the table with the one leader of the state and negotiate things. Th those are features of fascism as it's usually been defined. And I think you're getting something much looser in an attempt to characterize Trump and his followers. I, his followers are, are many of them militant, many of them are gun crazy. I think um, many of them are moved toward action, they're macho, all that, uh, and they're dangerous. The numbers of militias in the country is dangerous. But this has been with us um, for 50 years and more, and I've been hearing the word fascist about right-wing politicians for that long. And it just seems to me dodging the problem of trying to define the specific malady that we're dealing with. And I will say, President Trump does seem to me to have been dangerous. I rejoice at the fact that the danger, that danger seems to be passing away. And his following is dangerous and potentially violent. But fascist doesn't, I think, capture much. Leo or Jed? Well, I'll say, I'll just say one quick thing that I think, you know, maybe we toy around with the labels of, of, you know, a term like fascist, because I think we're trying to perhaps get at something that the only language that we have for using it, for describing it is fascism, right? And so there might be other labels for it. Perhaps it's authoritarianism. Perhaps it's the idea or the notion of, you know, how democracies die. But I think one thing that is worth pointing out is that you never quite know what you're in until after you're in it. That's true. And so I think this is, you know, we can look at it and, and, you know, as a historian, I really struggle with this because I like to have distance between the moment, right? And, and I'm not talking about, you know, five, 10 years, the political scientists are different. I know, and the political theorists, you guys like to be in it. Um, but, you know, while you're in it, you don't necessarily know that that's what you're in. Um, and so I, I do, you know, I do think it's worthwhile for, to, to at least talk about the language that people are trying to use to describe what we are going through and what we have been going through for at the very least the last 40 some odd years, right? Like how, what are the descriptors? What is the language that we use for, to describe, you know, a movement away from a democratic nation? And I'm not simply saying like 
Trump and the Republican Party, but there are also questions about the modern Democratic Party and the stranglehold that the two-party system has on, on the American body politic that speaks to some of these larger ideas that ultimately leads us to the place that we are in now. And the obsessive focus on the presidency and the president. Yes. But could I, um, one sentence on, on the term fascism. I agree with what David said about it. I think it's a dangerous word because of the vast disproportion between the moral clarity that it imputes and the lack of analytic precision. Um, I, I think one of the things that people are trying to get at when they name it as a characteristic feature of the last four years, um, really exemplified in the actions of Wednesday, but also the lie about the stolen election behind them, is the recourse to extra constitutional forms of action, especially um, the sort of shadow of, of popular action. Um, I think that's peculiar, that's especially difficult um, for Americans in the following respect. Democratic and constitutional principles don't always coincide. They happened to in this election rather more narrowly than many of us expected. Um, but one can imagine in an alternative 2016 or a certain version of 2024, uh, an occupation of the Capitol in opposition to the Electoral College if a Trumpist has, or a Trump indeed, has lost the national vote by seven or eight million and won the Electoral College. So um, the languages of democracy and constitutionalism are very closely tied together in American um, civic imagination and exhortation, um, especially in the, but not exclusively in the Cold War period and thereafter. Um, and it's a, they come apart and they come apart with potentially explosive consequences. There's maybe a, a civics lesson somewhere in that uh, to do with the responsibilities of the constitutional representative, a congressperson, a senator, and whatnot. Um, because one of the terrible facts um, about the disintegration of political order in the last few years has been the, the dereliction of duty by Republican representatives. And that that ill I would confine mainly to that party um, when their followers, when their constituents are, you know, plumping for theories that are crazy. Uh, it is the duty of a representative to um, not just follow mandates when the mandates are backed by non-facts, but to correct the people you represent, even at the cost of being turned out of office. Mm -hmm. I should want to lose my job as professor rather than tell a stream of lies about English literature to my students. One, the, you know, the loss should be preferable to, you know, the status quo of uh, maintaining uh, a good faith with people who believe lies. Um, so, I mean, that, that's part of civics that I think has been weakened considerably. Um, and, um, you know, the, the misunderstanding of democratic culture bias, a uh, senator on the other side, like Chris Murphy, shows that it's been weakened in more than one place. So let me, you know, Jed, you raised something that I think is really difficult in this moment um, in, your, in your thought experiment about uh, a, a potential protest around uh, electoral college result that flies in the face of, you know, um, the popular vote, right? And, you know, you guys have talked a lot about, particularly in the last session, that so much of democracy is about agreeing <laughs> to be ruled by your fellow citizens, uh, agreeing to go on in situations where you've lost fairly um, a political decision. Uh, but we do think uh, that the forms of dissent are permissible, right? Uh, in fact, we, I, I assume most of us think um, that forms of civil disobedience in, in particular respects are permissible or defensible, maybe even laudable, uh, and perhaps even contentious forms of dissent. And 
you know, one of the most striking things about left wing thought in the last 10 years has been a pretty sustained commitment to expanding the space of permissible disobedience, um, to defending forms of uncivil disobedience, to defending uh, civil unrest, uh, even in some cases, forms of political violence, particularly symbolic you know, attacks on statues and things like that. Um, but of course, one of the things that's striking in, in the wake of the capital melee is that a lot of people on the right are saying this is rank hypocrisy. This is, uh, you said it was fine when it was Black Lives Matter. Those people were sincere. We're sincere. Uh, why, is th why is this now indefensible? Um, and so I'm just wondering what you might see as the role of uh, contentious disobedience in pursuing what we're calling democratic reconstruction. So all those things that you're describing, economic redistribution, fairness, those things are gonna be met with real opposition and they may require forms of resistance or um, disobedience. How do we think about the place that plays in this politics and whether there can be any kind of consensus about permissible forms of disobedience that perhaps all sides might 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 come to some kind of agreement on. I'll try something um, that's not at all perfectly thought through, but I think a political culture's capacity to take up learn from and be transformed by contentious forms of disobedience is um, in line with, it's, it's in proportion to um, the strength of some element of adhesion such that people will stick together through it. And how, how to characterize that. I tend to think that democracy is the strongest place to look. And by that, I'm, I'm willing to, to stake a flag in the end on the idea that, that the majority has to decide which way we go in those questions that are inescapably political. But that, you can't just stipulate that. Um, you need a sort of investment in it, an affinity with it, a willingness to feel that when you live with a loss in some sense, um, in some sense it's you that's lost, but in some sense you've been changed by the fact that you lost, right? Because the civic part of you in a sense is somewhat, is someone different after the um, collective decision has happened. Um, you're not existentially affronted by the possibility of power being wielded by the other side. To the extent that's true, I think you can live with a lot more um, um, disruption. Um, I, and, and so I, I think the, this is, this is quite ill-formed, but um, I think that the acceleration of forms of unruly disobedience that, that you pointed to, Brandon, has been in a relation that we have to try to understand to what extent causing, to what extent simply shaped in its consequences by the um, erosion of a sense of common meta rules, constitutional order, loyalty to democratic order, even the sense of living in a common sort of knowledge world. Um, that makes um, disorder look more like a premonition of war than it would look among people who have more confidence in their resources for resolving even intense kinds of conflict. I think a lot of guys, young men, think that uh, destroying things is cool. They get excited, it's a turn on, um, and this is people of all kinds and all sides. Um, whether hypocrisy is the right word for it or not, I'm sure the double standard is the right word for someone who thinks that, um, you know, vandalizing the inside of the Capitol, a huge symbolic uh, 
edifice for all Americans uh, is okay, but burning down a police station uh, in, uh, that, that that's okay, but burning down a police station um, in uh, uh, Minneapolis is not okay. Similarly with the reverse. If you think burning down that Minneapolis police station is a great good thing, rah, what fun and what a moral choice we're making, but you think vandalizing the Capitol is a disgusting act of, you know, white brutality, that's a double standard too. And people who want to go on in a civic, civic culture that where the parts communicate with each other have to recognize um, that common sense prevails in the end in the way people make these judgments. And the destruction of things that are symbols um, and very pious ones to some people, but meaningless to others, has consequences of disruption for the society as a whole. Um, the case for nonviolence for me, um, psychologically, rests on my understanding that the only thing I know, that one thing I usually know for sure about somebody who commits a violent and unjust act is that he is someone willing to commit a violent and unjust act. And that says something. Leah? I think where I am is that I'm struggling through what feels like the unevenness of trying to define or coming up with a definition of civil disobedience and civil disorder that encapsulates everything that we've seen in the last five years, let alone, you know, the 20th century and the 21st century. And so that's where that's where I am right now. And so I think sometimes what we see, and I'm gonna expand it a little bit beyond kind of disobedience to say that sometimes we see actions that look the same, but in fact, they are not symmetrical. And I'm thinking about, for example, you know, people who are anti-vax, right? Who are anti-vaccine. We have one side that is anti-vaccine because, you know, for whatever reason, they say it's the arm of the state that you know they're they bought into the big lie that about what is in vaccine, and then we have another group that is anti-vaccine because they feel like they have been abused by the state along those lines, right? They have an actual history, and there's a great article in the New Yorker today that explains that asymmetrical, you know, um, uh, disagreement that I think is something that we can extrapolate out to this idea of civil disorder. I just, you know, I don't think anyone here is advocating for the idea of burning down a building, but I'm not sure how we can, how, how there is symmetry in saying people who are protesting by, say, burning down a police department that has murdered, you know, individuals within their community and historically had this harsh relationship is the same as people going to the Capitol and putting up gallows because their chosen candidate hasn't won the election. So I really struggle with working through the symmetry, but I also understand that under the auspices of democracy, there is something that we have to work out there. I'm just not sure what it is. I agree that it's right to feel differently about those two different people. Um, the consequences of treating them totally differently, that's a separate matter. Well, there is a question that we have from our, our audience. It's actually kind of two questions that this to this um, and to what they think, uh, actually really, really more of an argument than a question. <laughs> it's uh, that, they, that they think that, that there's a double standard here, but not in the way that we're discussing that actually um, the kind of empathy or sympathy or understanding that people are calling for, for the um, types of people who took over the Capitol and their allies in Congress uh, reflects an indulgence, um, reflects an indulgence about diminished status when that status was unfair to begin with, um, which reflects a kind of, um, a, a, a kind of kid gloves approach to uh, an essentially racist anger um, and an anger born of privilege, uh, a kind of indulgence that's never been extended uh, to, to the people on the underside of oppression in the society, uh, the black and the brown, the ghettoized. Um, so 
what would be the response to 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 a question like that, a claim like that, um, given that uh, a lot of what we're talking about is trying to generate common standards of judgment with which to adjudicate civil and uncivil disobedience or civil and uncivil speech, civil and uncivil unrest? Well, very quickly, I don't want indulgence for the people who broke the law in the Capitol. And I agree with all the congressmen on both sides who said they should be prosecuted to the full extent of the law. Same things for people who destroy property elsewhere. Um, the, the underlying consideration that the question doesn't attend to is 74 million people voted for Donald Trump, whom that crowd was ostensibly supporting. At a very generous guess, you might want to say very generous, that half of those people would not vote for him tomorrow. That's very generous. But that's still a lot of people you've got to contend with. And a lot of those people are not what they would call privileged. Some of them are probably what our questioner would recognize as poor. And what are you gonna do about that? Those people aren't gonna invade the Capitol. They're not gonna destroy things, but sentimentally, affectively, politically, they are in some way aligned with the destroyers at the Capitol. What do you do about that? Throw around the word privilege a lot, throw around the word whiteness and cure it. It's, that's not gonna get you very far. Well, my, my dear friend, uh, Bernard Harcourt, uh, the, the legal and political theorist at Columbia, wrote a piece in the Boston Review um, where he openly worried about whether we were heading toward a, a, a break in the society, something like secession or Brexit, um, where you, know, you try to develop some kind of common currency market or trade agreement, common protector, um, you know, protective agreement, but that the that the society actually just really starts to fragment. Uh, and I thought, you know, in the wake of this, is, you know, if there if there were these votes being held in in in, in certain states, it's not clear to me <laughs> that uh, the union would stand. Uh, and that's a really striking thing to say. I mean, I, I sound I almost feel like a crazy person saying it, but but it <laughs> it seems accurate. I don't think my judgment is awry. Uh, do you think that's on the horizon? I mean, is this is this a kind of uh, age of fracture that we cannot overcome? That 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 can't be put back together again? It's is is are are those questions questions that we may be forced to confront in in the upcoming years? And not just uh, in terms of secession, but also, I mean. You know, really deep partisan fracture. I know that's something that Leah, you've thought quite a lot about. Um, but there's just that the, our, our, the fundamental presuppositions of how many of us learn to think about politics seem to be shifting. And I want to know: Do those things seem like they're on the horizon to you in any serious way? And how we should think about that? It's always. It's often been very hard to subject this country to a common national rule, um, rule not only in the sense of sovereignty, but in the sense of a, a regime, a law. Um, and often as not, it's, we've um, slid by because of the continental expansion, because of constitutive political exclusion. Um, the decades of real sort of state maturation in the 20th century um, are exceptional in American life so far. And we still have both the constitutional order and um, more elements than some of us may have realized of the cultural um, plurality uh, that's, that made it very, very hard in the, in the past. So I don't think we have to talk about political forms such as secession or Brexit to imagine a descent into ungovernability relative to the crises we know we need to take on like climate and the crises that seem to many of us now to be intolerable 
dimensions of um, injustice and sources of dysfunction like economic inequality and structural racism. So I'll just say quickly here, uh, you know, to answer your question, Brandon, I, do, I don't think that there would be secession, right? Like fundamentally the way that our United States is structured, you know, Texas might get, and I'm sorry, I'm picking on Texas, but Texas might get this brilliant idea to secede, but they're not actually, not actually going to go through with it because of what the reality of that would mean. But I think I agree with this idea that, that you don't need something as dramatic as, you know, seceding from the union in order to see the fracture that exists on the horizon. And that's already here. That is already, in fact, I think been illustrated through our longer history and our fundamentally undemocratic history an exclusionary history that has really marked us since this moment where 4 million four formerly enslaved individuals became free. And so I think there are two things that we as a nation have not addressed, although I do think that there are moments where we have tried to address them and that fundamentally we can take all of these fractures and, and put them under this umbrella. We haven't addressed the question of race and we haven't addressed the question of class. And those two things, as long as they sit there unaddressed are gonna continue to kind of fuel, I think these large protest moments or moments of dissent, or moments of insurrection, and that they will only grow worse, you know, the longer that we prolong actually doing something about it. And now I remember, I think it was in our first conversation, but this has come up over and over again, particularly from civil rights organizations that have felt very strongly about this. And in fact, we need a South African style truth and reconciliation commission or committee. Um, and the thing that I would say to that is that it's not enough to simply do an airing of you know, inequities and inequalities and grievances and to point at someone and say, you did me wrong or you did my family wrong or you did this, right? as, as was the case in South Africa. But there also needs to be teeth behind these things. That in fact, if we are going to address racial systemic inequality, racism and things like that, that there has to be teeth behind you know, the decisions that we have around re reconciliation. Reconciliation isn't, isn't just talking things out and making nice and singing Kumbaya and 26 million people marching in the street. It's actual tangible, concrete things that come as a result of that. And so I, I can't help but think that, you know, if we were to have some kind of reckoning around race and class, that the, the on the other side of it, we need something with teeth that in the words of Michael Dawson, would be kind of a pragmatic utopian vision of America that, that addresses these inequities and inequalities on this really broad scale. I don't know how we get there, but certainly that's what we need. Yeah, it's just striking to me that like in this, in this moment where we can't even get people to agree on, you know, the vaccines, right? We can't get people to agree on how many people voted in the election, right? Um, that the idea of a federally backed civic education project about racial justice, right, would be met with anything other than entrenched hostility from huge swaths of the country. I mean, one of the, I mean, you heard the presidential campaign talk more about the 1619 project in the New York Times than the wars we're engaged in. <laughs> uh, I mean, this is, a, this is a stunning fact about our society, uh, how stubbornly resistant, how motivating, the, the level of motivated ignorance we, we bring to these discussions. Um, and it goes back to this, this question about, you know, the big lie or ideology um, in the society, a post-truth thing. And we're, we're, we're coming up on time. So I, I wanted to kind of bundle a few things together to, um, to bring this home and have you all say something to it. And I'll take, take our, our departure from, from David's work and one of the questions here, which is about this concept of moral imagination uh, and this idea that 
you know, we have a faculty to make judgments of right and wrong, that we um, can do this in a way we hope that's not overdetermined by things that are just to our benefit, uh, at least when we're at our best. Um, and at bottom, our democracy really seems threatened by people who've let this faculty atrophy, uh, people who act out of cynicism, nihilism, narcissism, racism. Uh, and I want you all to, to perhaps try to end on a hopeful note, um, is to think about what kind of cultural resources we have at our disposal for a renewal of this ability. We've talked a lot about policy. We've talked a lot about the economic foundations of these questions. Um, but where might we find these resources in these spaces outside of what's known conventionally as, as politics, right? Do our religious traditions give us resources? Is it something about, you know, Leah talked about a truth and reconciliation commission. Is it about a kind of collective testimony that we produce in common? Um, what are our best chances to, to promote the cultivation of this faculty and our citizens and our leaders? Is it an ecological movement? That's one of the questions that, that has been posed. Um, what kind of resources do we have at our renewal that, that, that might leave us coming from here with a little bit uh, of, of hope, um, justified hope, of course, not Pollyannish optimism? And maybe let's start with Jed uh, and then David, and we'll end with Leo. Okay. <clears throat> so let me try to answer quickly on two registers, one relatively practical, the other relatively um, less, uh, less concrete. Um, the more practical one is that it remains true that in politics, um, governing majorities can, to a certain extent, within constraints and with difficulties and dangers, make worlds and make worlds to which people can become attached and loyal um, and on the platforms of which other worlds get made. Um, the New Deal was such a world um, and the environmental legislation of the early 70s was, was such a world-making um, activity. So to be concrete about this, um, where governing majorities perhaps ephemerally exist as they do right now, they need to be thinking about quasi-constitutional changes that bring the Senate more closely in balance with national majorities, that make um, gerrymandering more difficult that find ways to constrain the reach of the Supreme Court and um, to rein in campaign finance again, such that it becomes possible with less extraordinary effort to generate stable governing majorities going forward that can do things like, and this is the, the um, sort of substance that follows from the procedure, things like make a world of infrastructure and caregiving like healthcare and education that people are willing to fight for because they think they have something at stake in it and they understand that they lose it unless they fight for it and they lose it unless they're part of the world that makes it. So the anti-nihilism is very practical in that sense, I think. It's extremely practical. Nihilism is, is sort of premised on the impracticality of politics in a certain way. It becomes a, an emotional vehicle instead. I know we're gonna have to go a couple of minutes over time, but I want to super quickly say something uh, that's, a, that's more notional. Um, and it's about what the idea of patriotism might mean. Um, it, it, it might mean not the complacency and arrogance of um, the, both some of those who claim it and lots of people on the left who um, recoil from it because of that. But it could mean two thoughts together. One is the, the view that your country's wrongs and harms and crises are particularly your problem and your concern. You're attached to them and they're attached to you and you can't just get out from under them. And the second is a sort of practical presupposition, a gamble that you're disposed to act on, um, that your country might have the capacity to grapple with its wrongs and its crises, um, not because you're sure that it does, but because you have a great deal at stake in thinking that it does. 
I think in this slide, it, it's not surprising that people who have been worst done by, but also have needed the most from the country have in some senses been the most creative and powerful articulators of um, forms of patriotism that are not complacent, but transformatory. Um, so patriotism as a sense of responsibility and a, a presupposition about what we might be able to do that you're willing to act on seem to me to be things worth trying to cultivate. I'm sorry the baby is crying in the background. Never apologize about that. Thanks. Um, thank you. Uh, and powerful, powerful points. Um, it reminds me there's a there's a quote from from Martin Luther King where he talks about making America great. And of course, for him, it does not end. And again, it's a it's a common patriotism around making America great by reckoning with its own unique evils. Uh, David, please. Yeah, I wrote down uh, a quotation from Shelley's defense of poetry, um, which I had once memorized, um, where he says that the great secret of morals is love or a going out of our nature and identifying ourselves with the beautiful which exists in thought, action, or person, not our own. To identify ourselves with the beautiful which exists in thought, action, or person, not our own. It's a fascinating description of what many people now would call radical sympathy or empathy. Mm -hmm. um, and it's notice it's not just personal. It's, an, it's possible to feel that way about an action or about a thought. Um, I, I do think that um, there are resources, personal characteristic resources in our, uh, to call it so, um, tradition. Um, some of them have been mentioned today. M Martin Luther King is a um, figure who has come up in a couple, more than a couple of quotations by Brandon. Um, Leah invoked, uh, W.E.B. Du Bois and talked about his view of reconstruction. Um, and I, I quoted Lincoln and there are others that we could talk about. These are, um, if we can uh, dare to say such a thing, heroic figures. They're admirable figures. And going back to civics and back to education, I think it would be no bad thing for Americans at a young age to learn the names and the achievements and some of the words and actions and thoughts of Americans who we, one can be proud of for their generosity, for their originality and so on. That's not done much. Uh, civics and history in school are taught um, as lessons about right and wrong, about this came after that and about causes. This is true of progressive education and is true of more traditional education. And I think the omission of the personal and exemplary from our ways of thinking about our history is a very unfortunate omission. The only other thing I'll say is, we've said not a word about America's relation to the rest of the world, but if we're gonna have truth and reconciliation of any kind and serious reform of any kind, we've got to get out of the way of the rest of the world, stop killing people in multiple countries and look back in on ourselves. That's the great evasion that we've spent time on for now, you know, half a century through administrations of both parties. And um, this expansiveness is the other side of what's tearing us apart on the inside. Um, we should be proud of many other things than our military. The one thing that everybody seems to be able to agree on to the point where our new president elect says by rote at the end of every speech, um, and may God bless our troops. <laughs> <laughs> Where are our troops? So our troops should be at home, maybe helping with the new Civilian Conservation Corps. Well, thank you. I, I mean, it's a crucial, a crucial point and one um, that I wish we had spent more time on in part because uh, I think it's tied to the fate of the democratic ideal. We're not the only country that's invested in the democratic ideal. And there are um, really serious projects contending with the democratic ideal right now uh, all around the world. Uh, people who are critical of it and think that it's uh, just as Chris Kuhn said, um, uh, deeply unnatural and not worth trying. So uh, our military adventures profane and, and hamper and harm the fate of the democratic ideal as such.
and uh, that in, in and of itself is a reason to, to, to think a lot about them. Um, Leah, I will let you have the last word. Sure. So, you know, I think if I think about the resources that are at our disposal and the ones that I think are incredibly important to this moment and moving forward, I think about history as a discipline, but also as an idea. Um, and I think about the humanities and not the humanities in the sense of, you know, um, something we teach in schools, but something, an idea, a way of being, a way of thinking, a way of thinking critically. And I mean this in the most expansive way, pro uh, you know, possible. Um, I don't want to limit it to, you know, one particular ideology, but instead the idea that the humanities allow us to think creatively and imaginatively in an era that is, you know, pushing back on the idea of the humanities being necessary. So I would really emphasize this idea of history and the humanities. And I want to point to an article, um, an, uh, you know, a piece that James Baldwin wrote in 1966 called The White Man's Guilt, where he talks about this idea of history and memory and how the history and the memories that we carry us are intrinsic to not only our identities, but how we interact with other people in the world, right? So this is an idea of post-truth America before there is, you know, we're in post-truth America. Um, but I also want to think about that idea of being creative and thinking imaginatively. And I would encourage everyone to really open yourself up to thinking about the kind of work and the kind of ideals and the kind of ideas that people on the ground are doing. And so this brings me to my last point. The thing that gives me optimism and the thing that I want people to be open to is the kind of work and the kind of, you know, protest even that we see from young people on the ground across the country um, and the kind of sustained protest for justice and for expanding the promise of democracy. Um, we should be happy that 26 million people around the globe participated in a movement for justice, right? Whether it be economic justice or racial justice or social justice, what have you. Um, and I think that's, a, that's something to be proud of. And it's something that we want to continue paying attention to and thinking about how can we use that to e expand this idea of democracy and bring the idea of reconstructive, a creatively imagined third reconstruction to the United States and quite possibly the world. Well, on that note, um, and the invocation of the humanities, which was once about soul craft and exemplars uh, and training people to be heroic when the time called for it. Uh, I think we're going to need a lot of heroism going forward, and we're very grateful to the team at uh, Humanities New York for continuing to provide a space for people to uh, pursue the study of that past, our past, the humanities, uh, and train themselves for a civic life together that looks better than the one that we've got today. Uh, thank you all for coming. Thank you all, um, David, Leah, Jed, for your incredible work, not just in these series, but uh, in your careers. And I encourage all of you um, listening to go out and get their books. They're even better than they are in person. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I hope all of us stay safe and, and do the right thing, as my dear brother Spike Lee would say, in a time where it's not easy. Take care. You too. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you.